So let's now prepare our hearts and minds for worship with our prelude entitled Impression on the Kings of the Orient. During this prelude, what I'd like to ask you to do in, in keeping with the pastor's message this morning is spend time reflecting on how God's gift of that precious baby boy impacts the choices that you make in your own life. Pam. Chris. Please hear now our call to worship. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. The Magi who study the heavens following a guiding star. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. The peoples who live in the shadows, see a glorious light. O oh, come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. The Christ, who embodies the word, unveils the hidden plan, making us join heirs of the promise of salvation through the gospel. O oh, come, let us worship the Lord. For God has done wonderful things. Let's continue our time of worship by joining our voices in the singing of verses 1 through 5 of the first Noel, which is found on page 265 in your hymn book or will be on the screen. Please stand as you're able.
You may be seated. While the Lord knows our every thought and deed long before we even think about living them out, he calls us to confession as part of our cleansing. Please hear our prayer of confession. Wondrous God, we confess that we have not listened for your word as we should. We confess that we have placed obstacles in the way of our neighbors and acted with selfishness and unkind hearts. We confess our short tempers, our quick tongues, and our inability to be patient. We are guilty of being proud and arrogant. Forgive us for our foolish ways and hatefulness. Forgive us for taking your amazing gift of grace for granted. Redirect us, Lord, by your spirit, that we may be your faithful people once again. I would ask now that you take a couple moments to confess your sins. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear this assurance of pardon. Being baptized was a burial of your old life and a resurrection by God by raising you from the dead, just as he did Christ. When you were stuck in your old life, you were incapable of responding to God. He brought you alive right along with Christ. All sins are forgiven, the slate wiped clean, all past indebtedness is canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please share the peace of Christ. This new year and walk through this year. Oftentimes we think that we are all alone, that we have to go through things all by ourselves. But we need to be reminded that Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, to the end of the world. He went to the cross for us, and we have that confidence in him. By his shed blood that will never lose its power, we can walk from day to day in full confidence.
the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. No, it will never lose its power. I'm saying. like Christmas around here, doesn't it? And you know, uh, today is officially a day called Epiphany. That's a pretty big word. And I saw this on Facebook, so this <coughs> must be something good to do, okay? What are these? M&Ms, yeah. Well, and what letter do they have on them? Oh, you're all so smart. You know, if you turn this a certain way, it looks like a three. Have you ever thought about that? You have? It does. It looks like a three. And then if you turn it another way, it looks like a, a W. So Pastor Chris is going to be talking about, we've already mentioned it, we sang a song about them too, the three wise men. Because supposedly they finally got to Jesus about this time, although it was a couple of years, but I can't say too much because when I do the sermon, and steal it from the preacher. He like doesn't like that. Though. <laughs> so, so I have brought over here. I touched these, but we're not gonna we're not gonna touch these. But this is a king, and this is his what? No, that's not. A, that's a camel. That's a camel. So we can't look at those or touch those. But I have some that my husband, that guy that was up here before when he was a little kid, he painted these things. You could pass these around. And here's a camel. Wonder why wonder why they didn't uh, I don't know, ride a donkey or a horse or something. You have any idea? Did you ever think about that? We'll start these this way. Well, su supposedly these guys came from a place, maybe even Saudi Arabia. I have a son that lives in Saudi Arabia, and it's way far away. There's a lot of deserts there. And do you know what the camel, you know why a camel has a hump? Say that again. It carries its water in there. That's right. There's not always a lot of water there, so the camel can survive because it has a hump that helps with that. So that's probably why the wise men had to do that. It took them a long time to get there. Good, put those back in here. So they had heard that there was a king born, thinking that was like Jesus, and they wanted to come and see him. So they took this long, long journey, and they did find him. They found him. Mary and Joseph had gone from the stable to a house, and they came and they worshipped him. Do you know what they brought to Jesus? It's not, pro I don't think anybody probably got any of these presents for Christmas this year. You just had this in Sunday school, didn't you? What did, there were three things, right? What did they bring? Frankincense, gold, and myrrh. Do you know what any of those things are? You know what gold is, don't you? Yeah, you know, you make jewelry out of it and part of our money. You know anything about the other ones? I was telling you about one of them. What did I say? This is an oil. It's an oil, and it kind of, well, I don't know if it smells good or not, but myrrh, I was telling you about that, is a very strong thing. Did they use that to anoint the bodies when they died? Yes. So those were things that were precious to them at that time. But they did come bringing gifts. And I have a gift for all of you all today. It's a kiss. Oh, I didn't get the reaction I thought I would get. <laughs> Actually, it is a kiss. It's two kisses. And so but what I want you to do 
I want you to take one and give to somebody and share. And because, you know, Jesus gave his life for us. So I want you to share and think about what Jesus did. And then you can have the other one. So I've got a kiss for everybody. Or two kisses. <clears throat> Here you go. Share one. That was, yeah, thank you. A kiss, a kiss. And give the other one, just like Jesus is a gift to us, I want you to give a gift to somebody. Those are yours. You can have them. All right, let's have a prayer before we go. Dear God, we thank you for the story of the kings. And we know that they brought gifts, but we know that you are the best gift that has ever been given to this earth. And help us to be more like you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, church, let's prepare to hear God's word from Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> you, would you please pray with me? Lord, we come to this time of revelation, this time of you manifesting your presence, this time where we see you sovereignly and cosmically at work. And so we pray that you shed your light upon us again this morning. Illumine us, reveal to us your glory, your sovereign hand, your grace, that we may marvel at your hand, at your love, and most of all, at your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray it in his name. Amen. In 1858, a scientific expedition was launched and went through the area which is now referred to as the Grand Canyon. A young lieutenant wrote this in his report. This region is altogether valueless. It can be approached only from the south and after entering it there is nothing to do but leave. It shall be forever unvisited and undisturbed. A few years after that, in 1863, when Abraham Lincoln delivered his Gettysburg Address, a, a newspaper editor from Harrisburg wrote, We pass over the silly remarks of the president. 
For the credit of the nation, we are willing that the veil of oblivion shall be dropped over them and that they shall no more be repeated or thought of. 2,000 years ago, a child was born. The next morning, as Bethlehem woke up and the townspeople greeted each other, many of them may have very well agreed, nothing really happened last night. And yet, that one event has changed us, changed this world forever. God became one of us that we might become one with him. It seems that the world around us has moved quickly past this season. Some would say we're way behind in taking down our Christmas decorations. Uh, the focus is on the new year, and the word epiphany is, seems to be losing its meaning and significance with each passing year. Just less than two weeks ago, people around the world opened their Christmas presents and have moved on quickly. But now, in this time, in the time ahead too, let's give the Christ of Christmas his. In this moment and until his first coming leads to his second coming. So I want to ask this morning, what does Jesus want from you? What does Jesus want from us? Why will that question matter to your soul, to your family, to our church, to this community, and all the days to come in this coming year? This important question, what does Jesus want from us? We're going to look at that this morning as we look at Matthew 2. Matthew alone tells us the story of the Magi. And still, after all these years, that word Magi carries with it a great deal of mystery. So let's separate this morning the biblical facts we know from 20 centuries of tradition. Now, we've already heard this morning and we've seen outside and in our nativities, we typically put three wise men in our manger scenes, right? Since they brought three kinds of gifts. But they usually traveled in groups of 12 or more. So it's likely that there were more than just three of them. Also, pilgrims claim that they have discovered the bones of those magi way back in the fourth century. And then later on in 1162, uh, they were supposedly moved to Cologne, Germany, where they were enshrined and remain today. But no one really knows how many there were, where they died, where they were buried. You know, very, very little. But what's interesting is even from the few details that were given in Matthew 2, we know that the Magi were really much more like us than any other characters in the biblical story. And that may seem odd to say, because they seem so mysterious. We think of these Pagan astrologers, we're nothing like the Magi, but think about it for, for a minute. Like us, and unlike Mary and Joseph, they were Gentiles. Most of us here, probably Gentiles. They lived in Persia, okay? And so they're the first foreigners invited to worship the Christ, even at, uh, as a young child. And that is so significant to the way that God has unleashed the gospel to the nations. And like us, unlike Mary and Joseph, they were people of means. Now, we may not necessarily think of ourselves as people of means, but compared to Mary and Joseph, I'm pretty sure most of us are, 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 are doing better than they were, especially early on when uh, that, uh, Jesus was born. In fact, they were so wealthy that they could afford, think about this, they could afford to leave their homes for many, many months at least, if not a year, and they could afford to bring the finest gifts to this child. And I also have heard a, an, an, the interesting um, argument. How were Mary and Joseph and the baby, you know, the child, Jesus, able to eventually leave Bethlehem, flee to Egypt for their lives when they probably didn't have much? Uh, well, they had these gifts, the Lord's provision for them. So, again, the, the Magi were people of means. Also, like us and unlike the shepherds, they were well-educated. Okay? They were the most learned people, some of the most learned people in their society, uh, scholars in philosophy and in medicine and, and science of the time. 
And like us, they were people of faith. Very different faith, but people of faith. In fact, they were kind of the religious leaders in ancient Persia. That no sacrifice could be made in their worship unless one of the Magi were present. They were intimately involved in that. So we have a little bit of background to them, and maybe we're, they're not as different as us as we usually think. But I want to ask a few questions this morning, and this is one of them. How did they know of the birth of the Christ? They are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Uh, they, they have limited contact, it seems, with uh, Judaism. Uh, and why do they know of this Christ? Well, we did that long series on Nehemiah, remember? <laughs> for many, many weeks. We've been referring to it a number of times since. Uh, we need to remember that the Jewish people had been enslaved in Babylon for six centuries before Christ. And we also know that the, the rule of power changed over to, to Persia. And even after the people were permitted to return to Judea, many remained in Persia. And during those decades in exile, the, the Israelites clung to those prophecies that the Messiah was coming. The prophets were telling them. They were clinging to it. The liberator would come. And so their teachings and their beliefs about the coming Messiah was known to the Persians and would have been particularly of interest to the Magi. They would have been intrigued by this. They knew a liberator, the king of the Jews, was coming. How did they know to come to Jerusalem? Some say, well, the star led them. We'll get to that in a minute, though. All right, so we think of that. Okay, maybe they had that backdrop with the Jews that, were, that remained in Persia. But really, this belief, we think, is so isolated that there's these hundreds of years between the last prophet, Malachi, and the coming of Jesus that it's just been, been completely forgotten about the promised Messiah. But we look at some of the historians of, of the day before uh, or, or, or around the time of Christ's coming. The Roman historian Suetonius wrote this, there had spread over the Orient an old and established belief that it was fated for a man coming from Judea to rule the world. And then Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, wrote something like this. The Jews believed that about that time, one from their country should become governor of the inhabitable earth. All right? This king of the Jews was going to come and rule. And so the, and we think, okay, well, that's, that's pretty significant. But it's likely that, that the Magi knew even more. Again, if they knew uh, of, of the Jews from the exile... What about their scriptures? Okay, the Jewish scriptures told the Magi even how the Messiah would come. In Numbers 24, a star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Now, some would say, well, that's metaphorical. Yeah, maybe. But could it be literal, too? Uh, also, um, they, they could look at Isaiah 60. Nations will come to your light. Light of what? And kings to the brightness of your dawn. And then the rest of this opening chapter of, 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 of Isaiah 60 gets even more specific. Herds of camels will cover your land, all from Sheba. Where's Sheba? Okay, it's to, the, it's to the west. It's hundreds of miles away. The Magi's homeland will come bearing what? Gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. All in Isaiah 60. Matthew 2, he's very intentional saying, okay, Jesus has fulfilled this, all right? So the scripture, scriptures foretold that the star would announce the arrival of this king, of this Messiah, and then just such a star appeared before them in their time. Can you imagine the excitement? What kind of motivation would cause them to bring such gifts over such a long and often dangerous travel to on, on, on these promises of old. Uh, they were intrigued and anticipating this. So the scriptures, they foretold this star. And I think it's really interesting because this is just one of many examples of how scripture over and over baffles us, baffles our curiosity just about how certain things happen. If Matthew 2 could be very familiar to us, Epiphany could be very familiar to us, we hear the story as a child, especially this time of year, but imagine how strange, hearing this for the first time, a star, scientifically especially, but 
How strange this would be. How things came about. How did this star get the Magi from the east to Bethlehem? Well, our text does not say that it led them all the way to Jerusalem. We assume that, that they saw the star in the east and they followed it all the way to Jerusalem. Well, they could have known the prophecies and they could have gone to Jerusalem because he's going to be the king of the Jews. It only says we saw his star in the east. They arrived in Jerusalem. We saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. But how did this star then go ahead of them? It does say that. Go ahead of them in that little five-mile or so journey from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. How did that star actually go ahead of them? And then in Matthew 2, 9, the rest of the verse continues to say, how did that star stop? over the place where the child was. Now, if you're in my thinking, it's like the end of the rainbow, right? The star's just going to keep going. We're not going to see a star stop over a house. And so how does all this happen? And the answer I have for you, I don't know. (laughs) That's the answer. We don't know. There are numerous efforts to try to explain it by conjunction of planets. Uh, comets, supernova, miraculous lights, but we don't know. But what we do know, what is plain, is that this star is doing something that it cannot do on its own, that there is only one person that can be, be behind the intentionality of the stars, and that's God himself. That's our sovereign God. That's what's going on here. The point is clear. God is guiding the nations to his son so that they can worship him. Don't lose that central reality in the midst of this passage and how significant that is to us and ultimately to uh, the final fulfillment and consummation. This is God's design to lead the nations to his son that they may worship him now and forever. Okay? And he is doing it by exerting global, even universal influence to get it done, to come to this small child in Bethlehem. Now, the Gospel of Luke, I think this is an interesting comparison, and I came across this last month. Uh, John Piper shared it in a devotion. The Gospel of Luke shows God influencing the entire Roman Empire so that the census could come at the exact time to get an unknown virgin to Bethlehem to, to fulfill prophecy with their delivery. Okay, We come from Bethlehem. And then here in Matthew, it shows God influencing the stars in the sky to get a group of pagan foreigners to Bethlehem so they can worship the king of the Jews, a child of another religion in in, in place. So what about their journey? What was their journey like? Again, sorry to disappoint you. We don't know very much. But what we do know is that this journey took longer than our nativity scenes permit much much longer in fact that to find the christ they would have to travel as we said earlier for many months after his birth maybe even more than that and this is why matthew's account says that they came to the house not the stable not the manger and they found the child not the infant not the baby it's a different word And this is why, and we don't often read the next part of Matthew 2, we don't see it in many Christmas pageants, why the murderous King Herod killed all the boys, uh, Jewish boys, in the vicinity under the age of two. Why that number? Because of the approximate age of Jesus. But this was all in a vain attempt to preserve his power. Okay? So another question what of the gifts that carried them, that they carried to present to this divinely chosen child? And we'll be singing again about those with uh, We Three Kings, and you've probably heard this before, but it is so very beautifully significant for us. Gold, for Persians, never came to a king, before a king without it. Frankincense, uh, again, we heard a little bit from, from, from Pam. Thank you for not stealing the thunder, Pam. Uh, <laughs> and oil, which priests would use in worship. Often you'll also say that this frankincense is an offering to God. So it's not only a, a, a gift to give to a priest to offer, but it was ultimately offered to God. So 
It's pointing not only to the priestliness of Jesus, but to the divine nature of Jesus. Um, but to, to, to think of it in pragmatic terms, uh, frankincense was covering the odor of the sacrifices uh, in, in worship. It was a very practical gift to give particularly to a priest, one who was the one who stood in the gap, who is that mediator between God and the people, and Jesus is the one and only for us. And then there's myrrh, that anointing substance. It was used for many purposes. It was a beautiful fragrance. Um, and most notably, uh, often in, in biblical times, it was for embalming and burial to again cover up an odor. Um, so this was a gift appropriate for one who would die. And each of these gifts, they point to two things. They proclaim who he is, who he already is, but they also point to what he would become, what he would accomplish for you and me and the nations as we see through the Magi. And so as we kind of get to the application, if the, if the wise men could visit us today, they might very well ask us, how wise are you? Are you wise enough to, to do what they did, to, to seek out the Christ and worship him? And some refuse the child like Herod. They're afraid that it will interfere with their plans and dreams. Some may ignore him like the scribes, the teachers of the law, they chose not to go with the Magi to find the Messiah. They were too busy with their own lives and work. They may, have no, may make no time for him, or they just dismiss him entirely. But what about the wise? That's what we're, we're seeking to be, right? What about the wise? The wise still seek him as their savior and sacrifice. Wise men and women accept his death on the cross. For their sins, they trust him for their salvation. Uh, really, Brenda sang that powerfully to us, the significance of Christ's death for us now and always. And so as the Magi offered their myrrh, so wise offer him their grateful faith in his sacrifice. What has accomplished? Are you this wise? The wise still seek him as their priest. And this is one we often overlook. Read the book of Hebrews. You want to understand Jesus as your priest, read the book of Hebrews. It's very much central to the whole book. Um, as the priests offer those daily sacrifices, as they met with the people daily for worship, so you can meet with your perfect priest, your mediator, your intercessor right now, and you don't have to take years and travel 500 miles to do it. You can be with him now, for he is your priest, to pray for you, to lead you into the presence of the Father, to guide you in his kingdom service. And so as the Magi offered their incense, so wise people trust in him as their priest. Are you that wise? The wise still seek him as their king. They give to him their abilities, their giftedness, their possessions, their time. They don't just give what is convenient, what is habitual, what is expected. They give their very best to the king and lord that they worship and adore. And as the magi offered their gold, so the wise give him their lives. Are we that wise? And most of all, the wise give him their worship. We don't want to miss that when we think of the three gifts. What's more important than all of it? What lies behind all of it? Before the Magi opened their treasures, they first opened their hearts. They bowed and worshipped him. They gave him hearts filled with joy in his presence. And so can we. As the Magi offered their worship, so the wise live each day in his presence. Are we that wise? As we wrap up, I want to point out something I think is amazing about this story. The story of the Magi is a story of divine sovereignty. It is a tale of God's intervention in time and history, in the heavens and on the earth. And his sovereignty has not changed. It has not changed. Think about it. If God could move his people to Babylon six centuries before his son's birth, so the Magi could to read these prophetic prophecies, these promises about the coming king of the Jews, if God could do that, 
If he could use the the Magi's pagan religion to, to prepare them for the coming of his son. If God could move Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem, and again, I think we, we need to think about this. They would not always understand why they had to go here and experience this. They would have to endure much, and we may not often understand the sovereignty of God in the midst of what we have to endure. But if God was able to do that, and if he could create a, a supernatural star to guide the Magi to their house, if he can do all of that, then what can't he do for you? Where can't he guide you? Where do you need to know that God is in charge? What about 2019 is worrying you this morning? What decisions, what dilemmas are you facing? We know that life can be chaotic. We know it is often uncertain, but may we rest in the truth that in the midst of it all, there is a sovereign God who is more than able to guide our steps. So I want to ask you these questions. Ask ask yourselves these questions, but even more, ask him. Ask him for the wisdom to know which steps to take. Ask him for the strength to take those steps. Ask him to fill you with his spirit and for that spirit to lead you each and every day, each and every moment. Our sovereign Lord led the Magi to the feet of Jesus where they were able to offer him much more than their gifts, They were able to offer him their hearts. What about you? What about you this morning? Will you bow before him as your king, your priest, and your sacrifice? Will you spend the coming year in worship and service to him? Now, the Magi, they eventually had to return home. They had to part company with the Christ, but you do not. You don't have to do that. And so will you offer him the gift that only you can give? Will you offer him your worship? Will you offer him your life? This time of year is marked as a time of renewal, and we serve the one God who makes all things new. And that includes you, and it includes me. We want to give you this opportunity in this time to come, to offer yourselves anew to the Lord this morning, to ask him to renew you, to worship and serve him in this coming year and for all the days he has in store for us. We want to invite you. You have an opportunity to do that this morning, to come forward. You can kneel. uh, You can simply pray. But this is the time where we can uh, come before the one who led the Magi to worship him, that he may lead us to worship as well.
my prayer is that we will be just like the Magi, that we will be resolute and, and resolved to seek after the Christ, to worship him, to be led and sensitive to his leading, that he may be glorified in us and through us, and that he draws us all to himself, and to seek out how he's calling us to be a part of that. As we continue to worship the Lord, we come to this time of communion, and, and Epiphany is a time of revelation. It's a time of God manifesting his presence to his people. It's, it's a time of, of seeing how God has provided for us in every way. And we see that in communion as well. We see that as Christ comes and he shows us who he is and what he would do for us, just as those gifts pointed to who he is and what he would offer, that he is that sacrifice. We see it in the communion as well. We see it in the bread and the cup, the one who poured out his life for us, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, our great Savior, our sacrifice, Jesus, who is not dead, but who is reigning, who is risen, and who is with us as our priest. He intercedes. We have communion not only with one another. We have communion with our great high priest, Jesus, and he is the King of kings. And so we come to this table, and we invite all those who come in repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ, as you trust in him as king, priest, and sacrifice, to come to receive. We'll be uh, bringing the elements to you. If you haven't received with us in the past, we will bring the bread, you will take a piece, and when we've all received, we'll partake, and we'll do the On same. On the night when our Lord and Savior Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Redeemed of God, the body of Christ broken for you, take and eat with thanksgiving. In the same way after dinner, Jesus took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me.
children of God, light of the world, take and drink with thanksgiving. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you just as the Magi brought their gifts, brought their worship. We come to receive these gifts from you, to receive you the greatest gift, to bow our hearts, to offer our lives in your service. And may our lives be an act of worship as you draw all nations to yourself that you may be glorified. We pray it in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege, just like the Magi, to come before you with these gifts, with our lives, with our worship. We pray you receive it and use it so that you are glorified, that the nations know you, worship you, are in awe of you. Lord, we thank you for your son, the greatest gift. May we open our hearts and offer them to him. We thank you for the greatest gift. And we pray it in his name, our Savior Jesus. Amen. We come to a time where we can lift one another up in prayer. This is why it's wonderful to have Jesus as our, our great high priest. Uh, he is always, always listening, always with us, always interceding to the Father. So uh, do we have... Reasons to rejoice this morning. Celebrations. Barb. Here comes Mimi. <coughs> so I have to, um, first I like to um, celebrate Brenda and her, her gift of yeah. and um, my, I, I just don't even know what to say. Um, Spirit was with you. And it was so evident. Thank you so much for sharing. I was, I can't even begin to say. Um, the second thing I want to celebrate is that we have 54 children who have signed up for basketball. Um, we were at 53 yesterday, and then when we were t-shirts, <coughs> we got a call, and can my son play? And it's like, of course your son can play. So um, perfect timing, because we were we just picked up another t-shirt. Um, but we're very excited um, that we have 54. We have six teams of three and four year olds and we have four teams of five and six year olds. Um, so those are my celebrations. That's wonderful. And, and as Perry said, and as Rick Nagel share, one of the things that's come out of uh, a lot of the, the leadership planning, uh, the times we've come together, is that the Lord has blessed us and allowed us uh, to be part of his work with this ministry. Um, we're thankful for Jim and Barb's leadership and all those who've taken part. Uh, but this is something that the Lord has, has gifted us to offer to our community. Uh, and, and we want to make sure you have every opportunity to be a part of it uh, as we have our community come into our doors, uh, bringing their kids, being filled with joy and excitement. This is an opportunity for you to meet them and, and maybe for some of them, for them to meet Jesus. 
and uh, we, we celebrate that opportunity, and we hope that you'll seize that opportunity in the weeks to come. Come and cheer out the kids, cheer on the kids, meet the moms and dads and grandparents and families, and, and see it with eyes of faith of what God uh, is doing in the midst. Let's pray together. <coughs> Lord, we come before you, and we do thank you that we can enter your presence. That often we take that for granted, that because Jesus was born and lived, suffered and died, rose and is reigning, that we have that great high priest. We thank you, and just as those magi brought their incense, their frankincense, Lord, we pray that we offer our hearts to you. <coughs> we pray that as we approach you, we take nothing for granted, that we are in awe of your love and how we can enter into your presence, that you are with us always. Lord, we do celebrate your goodness and how you displayed that. We thank you for those who have offered their gifts and glory of you and blessing of all, like Brenda this morning, uh, with, for Pam and how she leads us every week, for our choir and, and, and for all those you've gifted um, in, in the midst of our family and beyond. Lord, we thank you for not simply programs. We thank you for ministries that you've called us to. We thank you for the ministry uh, uh, of being able to be on a court with, with children bouncing a ball because it's an opportunity to share your love for them, to get to know you more, to be able to uh, share that with community, to get to know those in our midst and what a privilege and gift that is to us. Lord, we, we pray that we are a people uh, that continue to rejoice for every act of your grace, the beautiful ways you show it through baptism, bringing us in and making us your own, through communion as we are able to enter into the presence of Christ and remember the greatest sacrifice and the life we have in him. Lord, we pray for those that we've lifted up. Lord, we, we pray for Charlie. We pray for Doris and their family. We pray for this appointment tomorrow. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who sustains, even when the valley has been so deep and long. We pray that your presence, your peace, will once again come. We pray, we pray that you sustain and continue uh, to do your mighty work, and that we give you the glory. Lord, we pray for uh, Donald's friend at school, for their family, for what they're going through. We don't know the details, but we know that it is uh, something that often is in the midst of our families. There's pain and there's struggle. And Lord, Lord, you are well aware of the struggle. And Lord, we pray that in our own places that we are able to offer your love and nurture and sacrifice for one another. And we just pray we lift them before you, knowing that you were working. We pray for Connie and for her surgery scheduled. Uh, Lord, we know the desire of her heart. We pray that you continue to sustain her. Lord, we turn to you, our great physician. And Lord, you, you teach us, you lead us, you heal us. We turn to you and trust in your will. Lord, we pray for Mimi and her family. We pray you continue to sustain them in this season of loss and grief. Give them not only travel mercies, but sustain and lift hearts in your living hope that we have in the Savior. Encourage them, and may their time together be precious. And Lord, we pray for Randy's brother, Wayne. We don't know all the details of why he's losing weight. Lord, there are concerns because of family history, but Lord, we also trust in you. Lord, we pray. Our desire is for you to be working medically and miraculously. We desire healing for all those mentioned. And Lord, we pray as we trust in you to lead us even when we don't understand. As we think of Mary and Joseph and the Magi, that even when we could not, they could not know what was going on, you are sovereign, you are working, and we pray for those. We pray for us in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of struggle. Lord, we pray not only for ourselves, but those in our midst also in struggle, that you call us out, out of our places of comfort and familiarity, that we are sent, just as the Magi, send us to those places where we can encounter Christ in the lives of those around us, and to be able to respond with your love. 
just as you have given it to us. Lord, burdens on our hearts unspoken, we live to you. And we trust all into your sovereign good hands. And we pray all these things in the name of the one who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Let us stand and, and, and give praise to the greatest gift ever given as we celebrate our Savior as we sing We Three Kings. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, we hope you'll join us for a time of fellowship following the service. Uh, also, if you have a need of prayer, if something stirred within you, if you have questions about something you heard or um, just something that's on your heart or mind, I'd be overjoyed to talk or to pray with you. Uh, we want to remind you this evening, we have our prayer and praise service 
where we're going to again be bringing ourselves, uh, asking the Lord to renew us uh, as only he can. We hope you'll join us for that time. And of course, next week again, baptism of the Lord Sunday as we rejoice with the Markhams and with, with Kelly McClure. And now receive this benediction from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You are all sons and daughters of the light, sons and daughters of the day. Therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up, just as in fact you were doing. Be joyful always. And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.